So moving to <clears throat> the example, um, what we have here, as I mentioned, is an example where we'll walk through the whole process of doing a disinfection design using the CT concept. So we have a situation here where you're told that this town has selected ozone as the primary disinfectant and chloramine as the secondary disinfectant. pH of the water entering the contact chamber is 7.0 and the winter temperature is five degrees. And you're asked to design a disinfection system that meets all of the regulatory requirements. You will design the contact chamber and we'll design a, the feed rates for sodium hypochlorite and ammonia to achieve a dichloramine dose of 1.6 milligrams per liter. So you're given design parameters. You've got a design flow of the 30,600 meters cubed per day. You're told that the water is treated by conventional coagulation, sedimentation, filtration, exactly the same as the process diagram that we looked at yesterday during tutorial. You're told that the time to reach the most distant customer at the minimum demand flow rate is 62 hours. So just kind of thinking about this, you're told most distant customer and minimum demand flow. Why are those the the criteria that we're using? Most dist distant customer, minimum de demand flow. So if we're looking at the distribution now with disinfection, we're not looking at the water quality at the, pla the plant tap. Exactly. We're looking at out in the distribution system. And exactly, that's very true. It's going to take the longest amount of time to reach that most distant customer and at that minimum demand. So this is the in terms of a detention of a we'll call it a detention time in the distribution system. That's going to be the maximum, which means that we have the greatest time for which disinfection byproducts to form. And then the other thing is that it's the greatest time for your disinfectant to react or to decay is likely to be at the lowest concentration. And we need a residual for surface water in at least 95% of the samples taken within a month. So you're provided a number of design parameters or water quality parameters really for the Faraday River. So you've got a high TOC, bromide concentration of 10 micrograms per liter. And the reason we worry about bromide is when we ozonate that <clears throat> bromide reacts with ozone to form bromate, which is carcinogenic and has a MCL of 10 micrograms per liter. There is no MCL for bromide, but there is for bromate. And good question. TOC stands for total organic carbon. Okay. Turbidity, highly variable, not uncommon for a surface water. When you're looking at your mini design and you're looking at the Kalamazoo River, think about that. How does variability of water affect your plant operation? And then we're given information about Giardia 
viruses and crypto. And anytime there is, you're designing and constructing and operating a new plant, you're required to monitor for 24 months prior to operation to determine con the concentrations of these three <clears throat> microbials in order to determine what we refer to as the bin number, which we'll explain in just a bit. The, you're also told that the potential for AOC, which is assimilable organic carbon, and assimilable organic carbon is that organic carbon that's typically low molecular weight that is relatively easy for the microorganisms to degrade tends to result in biofilm formation in the distribution system. And why might we not want biofilm formation in the distribution system? Why is that typically considered not a good thing? Any thoughts? Okay. Number of reasons. One, if you have a biofilm formed on the inside of the pipes in the distribution system. That biofilm consumes a disinfectant. Okay, so your disinfectant can react with the chemicals, the cells, okay, in that biofilm. And that's going to consume disinfectant. That means that you have less disinfectant to protect against the proliferation of microorganisms. Another reason is that the biofilm can provide a habitat for Legionella, which is a microorganism that the Legionella pneumophila can cause pneumonia, um, very serious pneumonia, and and can cause death. So if that um, water is inhaled that has Legionella in it, then that can cause serious problems. And then lastly, it can provide microenvironments that are devoid or deficient in O2. And that can result in corrosion. So then we have pitting on the in the inside of the pipe and, and significant corrosion. So for that reason, we're concerned with the presence of assimilable organic carbon. So that's formed. So for instance, TOC plus ozone reacts to form low molecular weight compounds, which are referred to as assimilable organic carbon. And this is DBP, formation potential. So because your TOC is high, there's a significant potential for the formation of disinfection byproducts. So all of these need to be considered when you're looking at your mini design and as you move forward in looking at the disinfectant. What we need to do is we'll use the long-term to enhance surface water treatment rule to determine what this bin number is. So it's bin one. So we need to look at what the concentrations were for each of those microbials and determine what the log treatment. So first thing is crypto, and you're told that there are two cysts. These are actually OO cysts per liter. So we're in bin three. You're told that you have additional conventional filtration, which is what we mentioned. So we need an additional treatment okay, of two log 
inactivation. So two log inactivation is 99% removal. So we continue with each with Giardia. And Giardia, you're told that there are five cysts per 100 liters. So we need, in this case, this is a overall requirement. So we need a total of four log removal. So for crypto, it's additional. For Giardia and viruses, it's an overall log removal. So we need four log removal, 99.99% removal. Viruses, you're told that there are less than one per 100 liters. So we need overall four log removal. Okay. Again, 99.99% removal. So using this bin classification and the type of treatment, the next step we need to do is to determine the log removal required from disinfection. So you're told that conventional filtration, which is what we have, we get 2.5 log removal for GRD assists, 2 log removal for viruses, and 3 log removal for cryptosporidium oasis. So let's create essentially a table. We have Giardia, we have viruses, and we have crypto. And the credits from conventional filtration is given, are given here. So we have 2.5, 2, and 3. We've determined from previous analysis what log removal we need. So we need four log removal for Giardia. We need four log removal for viruses. And notice, remember, for crypto, it's an additional. So we need two log removal there. So from disinfection, we need 4 minus 2.5, or we need 1.5 log removal for Giardia. We need 2 log removal for <clears throat> viruses, and we need 2 log removal for crypto. The next thing you will want to do is you want to consider the water quality parameters to determine the primary disinfectant choices. So we now, your client said that they wanted ozone. Question is, is that a reasonable request? And would you agree? Or do you need to go back to the client and discuss the situation? So there's a few factors to think about. One, the presence of TOC greater than two milligrams per liter favors a primary disinfectant that will not produce significant concentrations of disinfection byproducts. Thinking about Flint, there were significant exceedances of um, the disinfection byproducts in the first half a year or so. And the TOC in the Flint River is exceptionally high and typically ranges from about 5 to 11 milligrams per liter. If the concentration of bromide is in excess of 0.1 milligrams per liter or 100 micrograms per liter, then we want to avoid the use of ozone or ozone UV and that's because of the formation of bromide, which is very difficult to remove, and as I mentioned, is carcinogen. 
So looking at this flowchart, we can start here. The question, first question you want to ask, and you're going to add, go through this process with your mini design and also with the homework, is, <clears throat> is the TOC high? And the answer is yes. So the next question you want to ask is, is the bromide level high? So as mentioned, the cutoff is... 100 micrograms per liter, and the bromide level in the water is 10 micrograms per liter. So the answer is no. And that tells us that we have some choices. Okay. Does tell us that we have a potential for high disinfection byproduct formation potential. It also tells us that we mentioned the issues with AOC, symbol organic carbon. So we need some sort of a biological treatment after ozonation to consume that organic material. We can also use chlorine dioxide or there's a potential to use UV. So this helps make some decisions about the treatment process. And you can see that if the bromide were high, it eliminates ozone as a choice. So now we can compare disinfectants in terms of their properties. This is straight out of the textbook. I would disagree with some of this. Um, and we could spend some time um, kind of debating uh, some of these uh, recommendations, but we're focused on then ozone, chlorine dioxide, and UV. And we'll have a guest speaker uh, to come in during one of the tutorials to talk about UV because it really is becoming much more prevalent in terms of usage, both in water treatment and in wastewater treatment. So we can go down this list and you see here that in terms of producing trihalomethanes, THM stands for trihalomethanes, ozone significant. Now, it's not really the ozone that results in the trihalomethanes. It's actually we ozone doesn't provide a residual. And because it doesn't provide a residual, we need to provide a disinfectant that does. And that's typically chlorine or chloramines. And it's really the chloramines or the chloramines that result in the trihalomethane formation, not the ozone itself. But it produces, as we mentioned, sig or assemblable organic carbon. Again, here it says it produces halogenated organics. It's not ozone that produces the halogenated organics. It's the secondary disinfectant. So we're looking at primary disinfection to achieve the CT requirements, secondary disinfection to provide a residual in the distribution system so that we don't have bacterial growth in the distribution system. Produce inorganic byproducts. We've talked about um, bromide, bromate formation with chlorine dioxide. Chlorite and chlorate are formed, and they are regulated because of being carcinogenic. Can produce bio, <clears throat> biological organic matter, simmable organic carbon. You can see ultraviolet doesn't have any of these issues. MRDL stands for maximum residual disinfectant level. Chlorine doesn't have a residual, decays rapidly. So there is no limit. 
However, there is for chlorine dioxide and there is no limit for ultraviolet because it does not produce a residual. So you can kind of see here, I'm just going to switch back. Ozone has an S. I would say the same thing for UV. UV needs a secondary disinfectant. Okay. Um, producing inorganic byproducts, if chlorine dioxide were used as a disinfectant, then yes. Okay. If chlorine is used as a disinfectant, then, then no. Here, the MRDL doesn't apply for UV, but it will for secondary disinfectant. So you can see kind of why I would disagree with some of what's in um, this table. So look at the table. It's potentially useful. Um, but if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, lime softening impacts. Uh, the big impact here is that ozone decay is pH dependent. And as the pH increases, decay rate increases. So you're, um, when you're looking at the CT, you'll see that it would have a significant impact there. And then you can look at, for here, you can see that we meet all of the requirements here for <clears throat> inactivation. Now, this um, statement about a secondary disinfectant, it's, it's really, can it be used as a secondary disinfectant? So think of it that way. And the answer is no, sometimes, and no, because it provides no residual. Um, and then in terms of skill, gives you ozone does need more skill than, for instance, um, chlorine. However, it can be used. And you'll see with UV, um, it is being used now in larger facilities. So let's, again, if you have any questions with any of this, just let me know. We can also compare the disinfectants in terms of process parameters. So again, we're looking at ozone, we're looking at chlorine dioxide, and we're looking at UV, gives you some indication. In terms of the process control, I would say ozone well-developed, not as much in the US, um, but ozone has been used in Europe since 1896. Um, so process control is well developed in the U.S. Um, the first ozonation facility in the U.S. was actually in Monroe, Michigan. Uh, it was put in back in the early 1980s, so they have significant experience. And now there there are there are actually hundreds of facilities. So as I mentioned, we need secondary disinfection, and that's to provide disinfection in the distribution system. So we'll start here. High AOC, the answer is yes. So we need some sort of a biological treatment or granular activated carbon. High disinfection byproducts formation, the answer is yes. We want to treat to remove that. Typically, that will be with activated carbon. Do we have an extended distribution time? Cutoff there is, is it greater than 48 hours? And the answer is yes. So now we can look at either chlorine or chloramines. And if we're looking at chlorine, versus chloramine, chlorine has a greater potential for the formation of disinfection byproducts. On the other hand, chloramines tend to produce a reducing environment 
and has been known to be associated with corrosion issues and lead and copper exceedances. So just kind of keep that in mind when you're thinking. One thing that you can do is use a booster station in the distribution system or bo booster stations where you're adding disinfectant in the distribution system. Typically, you're looking at liquid chlorine. You're not using gaseous chlorine because of safety issues. But you're adding chlorine or you're adding chloramines in the distribution system to increase the chlorine residual out in the distribution system. Therefore, you can minimize the amount of chlorine you're dosing at the plant. And if you're minimizing the amount of chlorine that you're dosing at the plant, you can reduce trihalomethane formation. You can reduce taste and odor issues due to the chlorine close to the distribution system or close to the treatment system. OK, so now let's look at the actual design. So we've made some decisions. We're really looking at ozone, chlorine dioxide, and UV, we will continue the design with ozone. Now, a couple things to think of. One, pH plays a significant role. And it plays a significant role, especially with chlorine, because with chlorine, we have OCL and OCL minus. And the efficacy is dependent on the speciation. Temperature also plays a significant role. And that's because at lower temperatures, it will take more disinfectant to achieve that same level of disinfection. So done some trial testing. Uh, we find that. Um, a study was done with two and a half milligrams per liter. We've got a decay rate. Notice this is a second order decay. It's one of the few times we will have second order decay. Um, and that the client prefers a contact chamber with superior performance. And this is a um, contactor that has perforated Inlet baffles, serpentine or per perforated intra basin baffles, outlet weir or perforated launders. Okay. As you increase that performance rating, you move from essentially a CSTR to an ideal plug flow reactor. We use the notice here this ratio of T10 to T0. T10 is, this is a ratio, it's 70%, in this case, 70% of a dye is released. Sorry, it's the time that it takes for 10% of the dye to be released. And that's 70% of the hydraulic detention time. Typically with ozone, we need at least 10 cells. And the diffuser is in the first cell. The cells where there are diffuser do not count towards C CT. So where there's a diffuser, that cell doesn't contribute to the CT. So CT is the concentration or the dose times the time. And the time that we use is this T10. And you're given some design parameters for ozone base, basins. 
So the next thing we need to do is to determine CT. We need two log inactivation of crypto, and we have a water temperature of five degrees. So we need a CT of 32. Notice at warmer temperatures, for instance, at 20 degrees, we only need 7.8. So you're designing for the lowest temperature in order to ensure that you can provide sufficient contact and a sufficiently high dosage. For Giardia, we need two log removal. Now, the tables in the textbook actually only give us three log removal inactivation and four log. So I've given you another table here. We need two log removal for Giardia. And the temperature is five degrees. So that's 1.3. And we need two log inactivation of viruses. Again, temperature is five degrees, so it's 0.6. In terms of log removal for crypto, we needed two for Giardia. We needed 1.5 and for viruses, we needed two. So we're CT, which is milligrams per liter times minute, is 32 for crypto, 0.9, sorry. 1.3 for Giardia and 0.6 for viruses. So that means that crypto controls the design. And that's not surprising because crypto, because it has this <clears throat> oocyst, it's a double cell wall is actually very, very difficult to inactivate. Good thumbs up. All right, cool. Okay, so we said that we had T10, we want superior performance. So the ratio of T10 to T0 is 0.7. We have CT equal to 32 milligrams per liter minute. And we were told we had a trial dose of 2.5 milligrams per liter. So 32 divided by 2.5 gives us a T10 of 12.8 minutes. So our T10 divided by T naught ratio is 0.7, <clears throat> and that's equal to 12.8 minutes divided by T naught. So that gives us a T naught of 18.3. Now our rate constant, <coughs> sorry, is equal to 0 0.02 milligrams per liter minute, sorry, minute minus one. And <coughs> we can calculate the concentration at any time, and this is, <coughs> sorry, with the detention time equal to C naught plus, sorry, divided by one plus K times T C naught. So we, we will have multiple cells in this reactor. So this is cell one, two, I'll just, three, four. We have a diffuser here where we're adding ozone. So remember, this first cell doesn't count. We have the concentration here. The concentration entering, so we'll call that C naught. The concentration entering the next cell is C. We'll call it 
I'm going to call that C1. Okay. The concentration then in C2 is equal to C1 divided by 1 plus K times T times C1. And we'll continue using that. So what we need is we need an Excel spreadsheet. It's what I have here. Okay. We've started with a C naught of 2.5. We need a CT sum equal to 32. Okay. And have calculated this residual using that equation that I just gave you. And what I've actually done with this is I have used solver to determine a hydraulic retention time or a T naught that allows me to use a, a dose that I'm adding of 2.5 milligrams per liter and achieve that 32. Now I could actually, typically you have between 10 and 12 cells. I could add additional cells and notice here, then again, I still have a CT of 2.5. I still have a, sorry, I still have a dose uh, C naught of 2.5. I still have a CT of 32, but I can actually reduce the hydraulic retention time. So in that equation right there, um, what is T? Is it the detention time? T is the detention time. So okay. it's T naught. <clears throat> so we use the T10 to determine the CT, but then we'll use the detention time in the design. Okay. So using solver, we have 10 cells. We had an, a dosage of 2.5 milligrams per liter. We have a detention time of 44.3 minutes. We also want to mi minimize the residual because it's just wasting ozone, and that is 0.78 milligrams per liter. And that's what I was trying to do with the solver. So for sizing the ozone generator, I have 2.5 milligrams per liter, 30,600 meters cubed per day, 1,000 liters per meter cubed, 10 to the 6 milligrams per kilogram, and that equals 76.5 kilograms per day. So when I'm sizing my ozone generator, I need to choose one that meets that requirement. The volume is equal to T naught times Q, and that is 44.34 minutes, again, times 30,000. 600 meters cubed per day, 24 hours. It's 24 hours per day, stay cancel, and 60 minutes per hour, hours cancel. And that is a volume of 942 cubic meters. So per cell, we have a height to length ratio of four to one. We'll pick a height of six meters, and that's based on recommendations provided in the textbook. Typically, you want a very deep um, basin because you want to ensure that you have as much contact with the ozone gas and the water in order for those the ozone to dissolve from the bubbles into the water. So the length is equal to the height over 4, which is 6 over 4. So we have 
meters per cell is our length, but we have 10 cells. The width is then 942 meters cubed divided by six meters, our height times the 1.5 meter per cell, but we have 10 cells. And that is equal to 10.5 meters. So that would be our width. Okay. The last thing, see if I can do this in two minutes, okay, is the feed rate for sodium hypochlorite and ammonia. So we're adding ammonia. This is actually what is done in the dye treatment plant in Lansing and also in the East Lansing Meridian Township plant. So we add <coughs> ammonia and so either hypochlorous acid, so we add, we add chlorine gas that reacts with water to produce HOCl plus Cl minus plus H plus. Or we can add sodium hypochlorite. So we can add liquid. Okay. This is monochloramine. This is the dichloramine. And we want 1.6 milligrams per liter. So 1.6 milligrams per liter. We're just going to do the stoichiometry. So there are 85.92 milligrams per millimole. And that's of NHCl2, because that's what we dichloramine. And that is equal to 0 0.0186 millimoles per liter. So really what the equation we're looking at is right here. Okay. And we can add ammonia NH4 plus dissociates to form NH3 plus H plus. So in terms of ammonia, that is equal to 0 0.0, if you can give me just a second, no, a little more than a second, millimoles per liter times the molecular weight of ammonia, because that's what we will add, times the flow rate, times the appropriate conversions, and that is equal to 9.7 kilograms per day. So that's how much ammonia we need to dose. And sodium hypochlorite, we have 0 0.0186 millimoles per liter. But we have a stoichiometric ratio of two. So we need two moles of NaOCl. And notice, as I said before, we can add the chlorine either as sodium hypochlorite or as hypochlorous acid per of dichloramine times the molecular weight of sodium hypochlorite, and I apologize for going over, times the flow rate times the appropriate conversion, and that is equal to 59.8 kilograms per day. So we now have done the full analysis. Again, I apologize for going a few minutes over. Happy to answer any questions that you may have.